Hey everyone, today I'm going to share a couple of interesting solutions to an interesting problem uh, that I've run across a couple of times. Um, this is a liquid rig within a um, uh, transparent glass and the the trick to this is that you need to have the, the mesh be able to deform inside the glass while shaping itself to the glass itself. There's a couple of ways I know to do this and uh, they both have some benefits and some disadvantages. Um, the one that I have seen, the one that I got from the internet, uh, it's very simple and I can show it to you guys very quickly, um, but it has to do with a uh, stack of geometry modifications. So that will actually affect the geometry of this uh, inner liquid, um, which unfortunately has some, some drawbacks uh, in terms of making the liquid uh, be able to be moved after I have some secondary deformations and that sort of thing. So if I move this, I can actually grab these controls with this new method that I've um, come up with here and be able to slosh these around within this space and be able to move those nicely. And as well, uh, on top of that, I can also add some uh, secondary nonlinear deformers. So I have here a wave deformer. I can do a pretty simple control here, um, which has an amplitude and a wavelength, and I can uh, affect the offset. I can move this around, all sorts of interesting things. So this is um, uh, a benefit of this, this new solution, which involves uh, using the shear attribute of a transform. So I will go over both ways, and yeah, let's get started. So here is the first method. Um, I've got my geometry, just some lights, and uh, the world plane here. And um, all the geometry is is this uh, double-sided mesh, the in, inside and outside, um, which will be our mason jar, our glass, and the inside is just the liquid here. The liquid is just going to be based on the same geometry as the uh, the jar itself. So if I unsmooth this, you can kind of see that just these edges are just kind of all more or less lined up. I've got one extra edge here to preserve some of the um, the space here and give a little bit of a sort of a um, liquid tension here uh, and the rest is just pretty simple. Um, the first method unfortunately I can't really use this set of geometry and I'll show you why really quick. I'm going to isolate this and do the steps to create this very quickly. I'll go over these so don't worry about it. Um, but I, it's, very, it's a very simple setup. What I'm doing is just cutting the mesh, deleting the faces, and then I'm filling the hole left over. You can see that what happens is I get this uh, sort of nasty end gone here, um, and that's just because, and when that smooths it actually creates kind of a messed up look here, so if I rotate this plane you can see that I get some kind of funky behavior here. So this is not what I want, um, although this is closer to what I want. So, um, so what we'll need to do is to uh, smooth this mesh beforehand. So that way it'll fit within this smooth glass, but uh, not have that uh, dynamic effect happening. So what we'll do is we'll take the unsmoothed mesh, we'll go mesh, and we'll smooth, and we'll just go ahead and delete the history. We could leave it in, but um, it's probably safer to just get rid of it at this point. So we have basically the same thing, just a lot more geometry. So what I'll do is I will uh, go to the front view and I will use the multi-cut tool which is in mesh tools multi-cut. I'll bring up the tool settings. I want to have delete faces on, extract faces off, um, and I'm going to create a slice plane by just dragging out a selection, by last selection, dragging out uh, a line and holding shift to lock it into 90 degrees and then have this dotted line pointing up. And I'll do that um, and that will create this polycut. So what I want to do for this method is to keep this uh, as is, uh, keep this uh, input and not delete history. So we want to keep this, this history and use it to, um, to be a dynamic effector of the geometry. So on top of that, we'll go mesh, fill hole, and basically uh, almost all of the work is done here. So we have our, our liquid and we have our polycut and polyclose border is what that ends up being. So in the node editor, that's sort of what that looks like. This is the shape, polyclose border, polycut. So to create a control for this, what I'll do is create a circle, nerves, create nerves primitives, 
circle or whatever kind of shape you want. I will scale it up so that I can see it. I'm going to delete the history and group it and then move the group up. So what I've done is I've uh, taken the circle, put it in a group, and I'm moving the group so that the uh, circle um, gets to keep its uh, rotations and stuff. I'm going to freeze transforms on that because that scale is supposed to stay there. Um, but now I get to keep this value kind of at a, at a zero point. So I'm going to use this to drive the poly cut. So this is my circle here. I'm just going to rename this control. So now this is control. I'm actually going to name the group above it buff, so it's a buffer. Uh, and what we'll do is we will we'll want to connect the translate and rotate to these cut plane center and rotates. But unfortunately, we want to make make sure that this uh, is going is uh, referencing the world space of the translate and rotate. So what we'll do to get that is um, create a decompose matrix node. Um, you can also do it using a locator, um, and there's a couple other methods as well. This is probably the simplest method in terms of computation. Um, just to make sure that this is working for you, if you don't find it, you can go to Windows, uh, Settings, Preferences, Plugin Manager, and under Matrix Nodes, you'll want to make sure this is loaded. Um, so what we'll do is we will grab the world matrix here, plug that into the input matrix, and this will output a readable uh, position for the polycut to follow. So if I created a, as just a quick example, if I created a cube here and uh, plugged the values here into the cube, it basically just takes the world position that gets output and places it right where that is. So it's pretty simple. Um, it's kind of like a very, very simple constraint. All right, so we'll just grab the translate, cut, set that to cut plane center, rotate, set that to cut plane rotate, and you can see that for some reason, um, having our our Y rotate here is doing some interesting things to the cut plane. Um, so we'll have a little bit of an offset here by adding a plus minus average. I think we can actually just use a an add double linear. And uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, attach rotate x, I believe. We can try a couple different things. Um, that creates a unit conversion node, which kind of messes up my graph here, which is a little bit annoying. But uh, And we'll take the output and put that into cut plane center x. And then we can take this additional uh, value at 90 degrees. Uh, no, not this one. Oh, okay, I put it into the translate. <laughs> Very smart. Second unit conversion node goes out of that and reorganizes my graph again, which is just totally ideal. There you go. I added 9 degrees to that. Um, you can kind of mess with it and figure out which plane you need to fix it by, but I've done this a couple times already, so that's how you do that. So that is basically the answer to that. Now we have a cut plane that is dynamically affecting the polygons here. So you can see how that's working. It's actually chopping down the mesh to fit this, this little area. Um, so this has got some advantages. Uh, for one thing, if you have a curved glass and you move this down, it will cut nicely. So if you needed to empty the glass or something like that or have it slosh around uh, near the thing, you can have that work pretty well. Um, it's pretty dynamic and it actually works pretty fast, so that's good. Um, the downside to it is that you can't actually add any more deformer uh, methods to this. If I grabbed a selection here and I wanted to do something like um, deform add a cluster, and I moved this cluster around, and then I tried to mess with this, you get some pretty messed up things. Because uh, when you change the geometry of an object, it changes the vert count. So you have to be very careful sometimes about um, what kinds of uh, things you add to the history of a mesh if it's still sort of affecting the, the polygons. So that's like one uh, sort of downside to this. Um, in general, it's not too bad if you're not looking very closely. Uh, you just want it to sort of slosh around and not really be that complicated. You're pretty much set with just this control. 
Um, but I'm, I came up with an interesting new way to uh, to be able to get this effect without losing that ability. So I will go into that next. Alright, so for this method, um, what we're going to do instead uh, is we're going to actually use deformation to get this effect, and we're going to use the shear attribute of a transform. So if I create a cube, like this, and I go into the cube's attributes, uh, you can see under the translate and rotate and scale, there's this shear section. Uh, you've probably noticed it before. Um, if you don't know, the shear has a skewing effect on the, basically the, the transform of the object. So um, if you didn't know about this, every node in Maya that has a shape like this, this cube or this circle, um, comes with not only a, uh, a shape, but also a transform so that it can be moved around. And if you look under display, you can set shapes. Um, so, you, so if you open these, you can see that this is basically the same as a null. So if I grab just a, if I am selecting nothing and I hit Control G, I get this null, which is just a basic transform here. Um, same thing with this. This is just a transform, and this is also just a transform, and underneath it is a shape. So like that's how shapes get moved around is by having a single point that they can be moved around uh, with. So that is what's happening there. Underneath the transform is a shear attribute, which you can use to skew the shape or to skew the uh, the matrix of the transform, basically. Um, so some caveats to this: uh, you FBX uh, export will not um, pay attention to these shear attributes. They'll actually error out if you if you try to export it. Will it'll it'll tell you that it didn't work um, or didn't successfully. Uh, export these values because it needs to have perpendicular axes. Um, so that is one thing you, you probably won't work for games animation, but if you're just keeping it in Maya and that sort of thing, um, this should be just fine for this scenario. Uh, and the other caveat is that because of the way that I'm using this, uh, for this particular demonstration at least, uh, you need to have a vertical glass, basically, or a vertical liquid in order for this to work correctly. Um, there are ways around that, but I'm just not going to go into them. Um, you can explore it on your own. It's just a very basic sort of explanation. So this is what we're going to be taking advantage of. We want to be able to use this this uh, skew in order to get these rotations to uh, perform like this. So we'll get into that. Um, there's a little bit of work involved that doesn't necessarily make sense immediately, but so what we'll do, first we will grab a joint, our joint tool, we'll place one on the top, and we'll place one on the bottom. And we're going to create a group as well, just an empty null. I just hit Control G, and I'm just going to snap those to those spots as well. I'm going to duplicate that. I'm going to call this uh, liquid surface buff. And this will be liquid surface fine. And I'll parent that there. This will be liquid base off. And this one will be liquid base off. And I'll parent that there. That way I don't lose the transform value here. So now I'll move this. Um, this will be zeroed out. And then if I move it, I can easily grab it and set it back to zero. Um, so now we will skin these. So the first thing that we're going to want to do is um, make sure that this gives us a linear skinning. So I've bound the skin now. If I move this down, um, we get a little bit of clashing here. And what we want this to, want to happen is this to flatten out. So in order to get this done, what we'll do is create a, uh, a plane. And we'll draw that out like that. And we'll keep it pretty much aligned there. And we will skin those joints to that plane, like that. Um, so now we should have a plane that also follows. There we go. And what we'll do is we'll paint the skin weights of this plane to be 100% for the top joint on the top, and 100% for the bottom joint on the bottom. 
making sure that I have the place on, set to opacity 100, value 100, in order to make sure that that gets perfectly lined up. So that should work. This bottom line of Hertz should not move at all when I move that, and the top line should not move at all when I do that. It's pretty good. I'm going to move these a little bit so they line up a little nicer, and then I'm going to grab these two skinned objects, both are skinned to these two joints only, and I'm going to grab plain, then liquid, and I'll do skin, copy skin weights. Um, so that should give me a pretty good linear bind here. So if I line this up, there we go. Flattens all the way down. Very nice. Okay, so here's a problem. Very quickly, if I unhide the jar and then I move this, you can see that when this squishes down, uh, this is kind of poking out here, going too far. So what I actually want to do is to make sure that the bottom level of this stops up here. Um, and that's just sort of the uh, thing I was talking about earlier. This is one of the limitations to the setup off just, you know, uh, out of the box. You can do some other stuff. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, what I'll do is I'll move these up. I don't have to reskin it or anything. I just do skin, copy skin weights again. And that should uh, effect, effectively stop it right there. Because all of these are now being 100% uh, bound to the bottom joint. Looks pretty good. Alright. So um, this now translates correctly and nicely moves this value up and down. Uh, but it still rotates in a way that we don't want, obviously. So what we'll want to do is to, uh, instead of rotating this, is to be able to use the shear effect here. And that should also, that should work just fine. So if I shear, like this, oh yeah. Joints don't actually have the shear attribute available. It is there. I'm not sure why transforms have it and joints do not. Just another weird incongruity of Maya. There's a couple ways you can have this show up. Um, if you want it to show up in the node editor, uh, we'll get to that later, but um, to have it show up in the attribute editor or the channel box, what you can do is go to uh, channel control and go down to the S attributes and move those over into the keyable. And you can see I have those there now. So if I move this value, you can see that's working how we want it to. So what we want to do is to be able to take our uh, control and have the rotate affect this attribute here. Um, so what we'll do is we'll create a control, we'll make a circle, scale it up, delete the history, freeze the transforms, uh, that would be edit, delete by type, history, modify, freeze transformations. Um, and you want to freeze those in place, uh, or, or at least that's how I do it. And then I'll group it and move the group up into place here. Actually, I can just... I don't even need to group it. I can just grab this circle and move it to this liquid surface buffer group and then just zero that out. That way we don't have to waste too many transforms and I can delete that. So what we can do with this is have this affect the transform of the joint there. So we just want to have the translate y affect that for now. So we'll bring up the node editor um, and then I will, then that will be in Windows General Editors. Uh, oh, Windows Node Editor. I changed my hotkey to be Alt N. Just want to bring that up so quickly. So we want to have this affect the translate of this. There we go. Um, I can can have it affect the others, but I'd rather not because we don't want it to move left and right anyways. Pretty much no situation where that would be what we wanted. So um, there we go. We can just lock and hide these. All right. So now we want to have the rotation affect the uh, control here, the uh, joint. So we want this to affect the shear. We want the shear YZ to be affected by the rotate X. So we'll grab that node editor, take the rotate here, rotate X. And we kind of want to show the shear uh, YZ here. So what I can do is I can show all attributes and have shear in this little uh, field here. If you don't see this field, uh, you can show it with this button. 
rotate x, shear yz. It creates a unit conversion node. Um, I kind of know why. It has to do with the fact that this is one kind of attribute and this is not. However, this still reads the attributes the same way as the rotate does. So this creates a unit conversion node that multiplies the input by 57 in order to convert it from radians, I believe, or two radians possibly. But um, it's not really what we want. It actually is way too much. Uh, if we set this to just one, it actually stays in line a lot better. So we want this to be negative one because of the way this was set up. So I'm just doing it really quickly. So there we go. We have that value going. Now we want this value going. Um, the weird thing is that these other two values don't really affect that. They affect two different axes here. So uh, in order to get this effect, we want to group this node and use the above group to affect that other directional shear. So instead of having this connected to the shear, I'm just going to use two different transforms above this instead. So I'm going to group this twice. So now we have liquid surface shear 1 and liquid surface shear 2. There we go. So now, um, what I um, have done with this is that um, if you hit 4, it'll give you a custom attribute list, and you can edit that list using the edit custom attribute list here. You can just go down to whatever attribute you want to have the always showing, which I've done here with shear. And then you just go out of that. So now you can one, two, three, or four, and four will show you your custom attributes. So rotate x into yz, set this to negative one. And then we also want to use yz shear for this one as well. We're going to do rotate z because I believe we have uh, y is the top rotation here. So rotate z shear x, y or YZ rather. So that's also going crazy, so we're going to have that set to 1 really quick just to make sure that's within the respectable range. So these two values are now doing the same thing. Um, so what we want to do is take this shear 1, or rather the shear 2, rotate it 90 degrees, and unrotate the bind 90 degrees. So just to make make that clear, what I've done is I've um, I have a I have a hierarchy here. Shear one is being affected. Uh, the shear is being affected here. Shear two has this value sort of set as 90 degrees, negative 90 degrees, in order to uh, deal with the fact that this needs to be perpendicular to shear one. And then the bind is set to 90 degrees to invert that same value here. I'm going to lock that as well. So now this is inverted and this is not. So what we'll do is we'll just go to this unit conversion, set this to negative 1, or you can multiply it. It doesn't really matter. Just do whatever you want. Um, whatever works for you. This is just going to be very simple. So now this pretty much works. Uh, the last thing about this is that um, because rotation is done uh, in kind of a strange, it, it makes sense, but it's not um, intuitive. What will happen is um, when you rotate this, you'll some, sometimes just start to lose it, and it'll just go crazy. Um, this has a lot to do with the rotation orders, so um, it doesn't always make sense immediately why that's happening. Um, but the basic rule of thumb is that the, the twist axis should kind of be the first in your rotation order, um, in this particular case at least, especially. Uh, so normally we have a joint, um, the, I think the traditional way to do it is have the joint have x down the line, and that way the x, y, z rotate order makes sense. Um, and then your most important rotation axis is just generally z. So if this is moving, then uh, z will be at the end, which is going to be the most important, and your second most important will be whatever is not this one. If you can't make it x, y, and z, you can always just change these so that it works. Um, kind of confusing. I don't want to get too much into it, but uh, what we'll do here is just take this control, the actual control node here, 
and we'll change the rotate order. And I think it doesn't even matter at this point. We can just have Y be first, um, and just the other two can be in any order. But just to make sure, we'll just kind of move things around and see how it works. And it seems to be working pretty well. Um, and we were pretty careful. If you wanted to mess with it more, it might be make more sense to have uh, your rotation order be um, a little bit more thought out. But we're basically just going to leave it Y, Y, Z, X, because that's good enough. All right, so this does not twist, and that's fine, because we don't want it to twist up this, this mesh down here. But this is basically what we got now. Um, it should all pretty much work pretty well. Uh, and what's cool about this is that we can take this final transform, uh, which is the bind here, and we can use that to um, add some more joints or add some extra deformers or something like that. So if I go here and add some joints here, and I just grab all these joints, and I parent them to that center joint, you can see that when I move this, they kind of skew out like that, which is pretty much what we want. Um, and now I can actually grab these, and I can skin them to this mesh by edit to going down on the skin menu to edit influences, add influence, uh, options. I'm going to lock the weights and leave them at zero for default and apply. Um, now when I go into the paint weights tool, I can unlock these. Um, and what's that, what that's done is it has added the influences without changing the weighting at all. And I'll unlock those. And I'll take the inverse, the liquid surface, I'm actually going to lock inverse and unlock this. And that way when I add to this it will only take from the surface. And I will just add a little bit of skinning there and smooth it out near the edges. Uh, just sort of base, very basic and you can do the rest as well. And this is our slosh control. So now this will move up and down nicely and when I skew this it'll stay within that range. So there you go. And of course, to add a deformer, you can go skin uh, in the rigging menu, deform, nonlinear, and do a wave. And we'd also want to parent this to this control here. I'll take this, move it into place here. And then uh, to get rid of the effect down here, all I have to do is grab. This area of the geometry. There we go. Grab the area of the geometry, go to deform, uh, paint weights, nonlinear, and then we want to replace these weights with zero that I have selected. Might be hard to see, I have the bottom half selected here. So I'm setting those to zero. Um, I can invert selection here by right clicking it and going to invert selection. I'll just smooth these so it looks kind of nice. And now this, uh, this deformer here will only affect that area. There you go. And obviously it doesn't need to be that, that crazy. You can leave the amplitude at whatever level. And just get a nice little like effect going there. So yeah, the basic gist is that this will now uh, allow for all the same movement as the previous control um, while also allowing for some secondary deformation. So the issue that I was talking about earlier is that um, this is sort of constrained to this area. Uh, if, if I bring this down past this level, it will kind of break. Um, that's an issue with uh, just sort of how this method is done. Um, the, the good thing about this is that you can actually add to this uh, because of the secondary deformers. So if I wanted to, um, I could take a cylinder to start with, and if I wanted to fit it to a wine cup or something like that, I could do a deform lattice, uh, and I can grab the base and the lattice at the same time, scale that up a little bit so it doesn't fall outside the range there. Um, and I can add some divisions maybe, and I can take these lattice points an effect so 
If you want to do something like a wine glass, you can have something like that. If you can fit it to the glass, of course. Um, and then you get basically more or less the same effect. You want to make sure that uh, your uh, lattice points don't get too far out of line uh, in the vertical plane. I think I might have scaled them non-linearly there. Um, but you can get something like that using this. I, I leave it up to you guys to, to figure out the, the exact method you want to use, but um, this will work pretty well for that, although um, it won't be as, as, there's a little bit more involved in terms of the creation of the, the thing. So, uh, But that is how I would do it in order to get that same sort of additional kind of uh, sloshing effect ability. Um, but there you go. So that is the method. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I hope you guys uh, liked it. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys uh, use it in your future productions. Thanks.